Hey, what's up? It's Jim, and today I'm going to talk about The Brave Little Toaster from 1987. And this is a winner of my Patreon movie review vote. If you would like for me to review a movie of your choice, then click on the link below and pledge, and maybe I'll be reviewing your movie next month. The Brave Little Toaster is sort of an interesting film in that it was never really released theatrically, although it did play in some theaters, but barely, and mostly discovered on home video and through word of mouth in the 80s and 90s. It's cheaper than most animation and most animation most of us really talk about particularly in this era and it's darker and weirder in places than a lot of that stuff was too i sort of remember it from my childhood i definitely saw it i wouldn't say it holds as big of a place as others when i started this film i was not really that into it and the cheaper animation quality really sort of turned me off and i kind of was even almost like, should I like tell Saber that this movie sucks and we should do like a thing on the Brave Little Toaster? I don't know. Like I genuinely felt that way at the beginning. And it took me a minute, even though it had some thriller things and there's like an odd quality to it while watching it that I really can't explain, but a memorable quality. Like I was compelled to like sort of figure it out. I watched the whole thing. I even rewatched that part and I still feel a little off about it. Like maybe something was cut out. Maybe the rhythm was weird because after a certain point, especially after they sort of grow his characters and like goes through down a waterfall and go in the appliance shop and then go and to the city and things i'm really with the film and especially towards the end i was like into it but it took me a while and and i found that to be really interesting and i find sort of the background of this film odd as well because so originally this film was supposed to be with disney it's based on a story called the brave little toaster a bedtime story for small appliances by thomas m dish i didn't read that story but it was bought by disney in the 80s and john lasseter and gil keen were thinking about making a brave little toaster in the sort of weird way much like they had done with this uh where the wild things are footage which, which i'll have on during this where uh the 3d the backgrounds and everything would be in 3d but the characters would be hand drawn that's an interesting idea um more than the execution i think the flow if you look at this footage works really well and the movement sort of weird now i kind of like the style of it i don't i think though this style would not age well at all disney actually ended up firing john lasseter over it um and he became the director it's he's credited as director of animation i'm not exactly sure how much lasseter had to do with it not because of what we found out about him but just in general it seems a little shady but he was apparently sort of the animation director but uh disney sort of sold this movie and it ended up that kind of transferred for the rights to uh, Hyperon Pictures, which was created by former Disney employees. And originally Disney was going to give it a budget of 18 million. And I think this was produced at a budget of around 5 million. And you can definitely tell it's on the cheaper side of things. And they weren't really sure what to do with this. Disney really didn't want competition out there. And they already had Don Blue's ass to worry about. So they weren't going to like be bringing on this into things. They really wouldn't let it be released in that many theaters. It had a small release would play art theaters, played film forum in New York. And it also was the only animated film until Waking Life in 2001 to play the Sundance Film Festival. They claimed the Sundance Film Festival wanted to give it best picture, but felt they couldn't do that for an animated film. No would take them seriously i don't know if that's true or not but that's a good story but it is the first film animated film to play at the sundance film festival which is notable for something and it eventually came on home video and that's how it was found now if you're like how could if you weren't a kid during the kind of home video era they would always have a kid section and you wouldn't have that many tapes because there weren't that many animated films or kids films at that time so you would eventually just see sort of everything of note or interest if you went to the video store enough times and to be honest they didn't have a ton of stuff so you would eventually see everything so with the brave little toaster being in that section and having a hungry audience for content this film kind of get gobbled up and as a kid you don't really understand if something's been released theatrically or not you just go hey there's a movie it's on video and that's how i watch things that's sort of how this movie became a thing and i do notice you know the lassiter ...ness of this film and i'm sorry if people don't want me to bring them up or whatever you can see allusions to certainly what to happen in Toy Story and this film, particularly with the journey and everything, I can actually find allusions to all three Toy Story films from the guy who runs the appliance shop. You know, you can compare that to Toy Story 2, to, you know, what happens at the junkyard is clearly comparable to what happens in Toy Story 3. They just managed to spread that 
over three movies and Brave Little Toaster just decides to do it in one. What this film does with a lot of its surrealer image, imagery and weirder things is like one you often wonder and I often wonder like you know I like my toaster I don't have a toaster but I've liked a toaster or my oven and stuff. I don't know if my oven would really care that much about me leaving and I don't know if I have necessarily an attachment to those things. I think when it's toys and unfortunately this does get compared to Toy Story because it is rather close that there's an emotional attachment there. If I see one of the toys or action figures or whatever I played with that reminds me of that time I have a personal attachment to that I don't know if I feel that way about my electric blanket which that by the way almost everyone I know who's had one of those be like oh yeah that totally gave me cancer I've never heard good things about electric blankets like I don't think people have those anymore for that specific reason actually that part is a little weirder and the journey at the beginning feels more nostalgic. And even like there's some logic gaps that make this film feel sort of dreamlike. Because they act like he was this kid under their logic. And then you find out through the protagonist of this film that he just kind of showed up there during the summer. It was like not their permanent residence. They sort of act like it was at one time. Which I sort of like the idea of that it was their house and these appliances have lost any semblance of time. And they've just been sitting there and these people got rid which somehow we don't need to know why and they've moved to the big city and then they realize oh fuck we have this house and stuff because we're rich we don't notice that stuff and they're selling it and they'll see like how they've changed or something that's what i assumed was gonna happen because i like mostly forgot this movie um but with how they do it and you find out it's his summer home and then you find out well he came back every summer wouldn't they know that he got older like that that part seemed weird to me and that it didn't like establish before like well you know he liked all this stuff but like he saw it like two weeks every year so you know that's the part that fell apart for me because like he really seemed he does seem to care about this stuff and i get it but at the same time he's like i mean how attached are you really and they clearly hadn't been there in a while but it seems like that those appliances would probably get used to the fact that like most of their life was the off season or something that seemed odd to me um but i kind of just take this to be kid weird dream logic because this film often like does a lot with dreams and fantasy and things of that nature quite freely and i know that is considered to be sort of lazy i actually heard that a lot from the pixar people which is sort of interesting since they knew someone and worked on this but whatever and i'm wondering what pixar and everyone learned from this film and i think uh they probably learned something because this had a good collection of animators some older who had even worked with walt disney and a lot of younger ones including aforementioned mr lassiter apparently we're using a lot of the framework that you saw from the um nine old men and how disney made animated features and i did say they do stay within that but they also break from it you know they do the character animation that disney's very much known for particularly with the toaster and the main crew there and there's a lot of moments that are very character moments in fact including you know everyone talks about the disturbing dark moments of this but i often find this film to be more surreal and just strange in a way which often finds it very compelling but the part where the flower falls in love with the toaster because it sees its reflection all these animals are very enamored of the toaster because of their reflections in it and this flower that falls in love with it and eventually like teaches the toaster that he needs to warm up to blankie or apparently the director said in an interview that that it's supposed to show the toaster that he needs to curl up with blankie at night or blankie might die basically is the metaphor there but that scene is incredibly heartbreaking because you see this flower find love because it hasn't been around any other flowers because it's growing away from everything and then it wilts and dies when it you know sort of gets some compassion and realizes it's fake it just sort of dies off and there's a couple like kind of suicidal things in this including with the car in the junkyard who decides that it wants to get crushed and things like that and there's a lot to do with wanting your place which is kind of an interesting thing i think this sort of works for children because children like structure they like you know having a set bedtime things like that kids you know probably don't won't express that but in their deepest core they love having parental figure two parental figures what have you and having that structure and being like now it's dinner time now it's bedtime and this film very much gets into that like knowing your place and knowing what that place does for you and the role of that and brave little toaster goes within that but it goes into kind of the darkness for that it seems like the reasoning of a child but as an adult when you're watching that you understand how you need to break out from that and i find it odd a lot of the th things with the idea of them trying to find the master this kid because you find out later in the film 
when they get to his apartment. With also one of those appliances is voiced by Joan Rivers, which I feel like you don't really notice, and I didn't notice until going through this. But you notice that he's very wealthy. You find out he's much older, and he's going to go back and get them from the cabin at the same time they're coming there, which is a little stupid, but whatever. And first off, if they just waited, he took his girlfriend to the cabin. I'm not going to make any grand assumptions here, but I'm going to assume if you're 17, 18 years old and you're taking your girlfriend to the cabin, you're definitely going to be like banging the shit out of her right there. So there's, <laughs> there's a good chance had he collected them, they would have been like, I don't, I don't want to go with that guy. What he did was just flat out disgusting but instead he wants to take them to college which i don't know what college is like for normal people i went to art school but i'm pretty sure those appliances do not want to go to college either <laughs> like it is not going to be fun for them like they're like oh i love this sweet innocent kid oh what the fuck like they're not gonna have fun at college i find that to be like the greatest irony of this is like they think he's going to be a child like they're used to that there's there's nothing about the evolution of people and time in this although that has happened anyway and they're not kind of paying the consequences of that you know they're paying the consequences to like do this journey and in that journey it's interesting even the shot where the the vacuum looks down at the waterfall and decides to go and save them and like the darkness that you see from these characters almost understanding if they're lost if they're abandoned if they're not giving their place how they will lose all meaning the brave little toaster has that dark existential quality to it as well as having these surreal sequences with the clown and the blanket floating down to see its master and has these kind of like weird fantastical fantasy sequences that goddamn work in this i mean it should not work as well but the brave little toaster is a unique film and it was very cheap i think the reason it transcended its cheapness and it really should have had a better budget and maybe given more of a chance but i think it was able to transcend that because of character I think it also had a good voice cast including john lovitz who apparently recorded all this stuff in a day because he had to start report to work at saturday night live and they couldn't keep him for any longer but they really wanted him so he was separate from the rest of the cast but i think it's because this film is centered around character and if lassiter and the pixar crew learned anything from this it is character it's such a modern blockbuster thing it's why we care about marvel movies it's why we care about star wars it's where we care about pixar and the new wave of disney films it, it is all about character. This is almost a better transition film. Often people say, oh, Oliver and Company is the transition into the Disney Renaissance. Oliver and Company, Oliver and Company sucks. It's not a great movie. I don't know why people, it's like whatever. This is a better transition into that period, the period that was going to explode. Like the 80s, you can see the rise that's happening. And I know I've talked about that in my 1988 series. But I'm bringing up this is 87, so I couldn't be part of that. But I think what this shows is like that coming wave of more character based things and in a weirder, stranger way, you know. And they even say they're not making a film for children. I agree and disagree because it's like, yes, it's very much in a child sense of world to it but like if you're older you're noticing things like the weirder songs and like i love the song about modern appliances which is the most 80s thing which is like the most dated way to be modern <laughs> but but the point is to be 80s modern so i get it but it's funny a little bit it has this darker edge to it that's going all throughout it and it doesn't let go it doesn't like go of you as an audience member it never lets go and it wants you to know how hard it is for these things it thinks about when you've thrown out your tv when you're done with it when you've had all these memories and your family's grown up around it and you had that toast that day that you know either grandma died or you had toast that day you know you got into college and you know you had toast that day that you met the girl of your dreams and how that toaster was there for all those things but then when that toaster's broken that that shit's in the trash and i think brave little toaster doesn't stay away from that it kind of gets into like what would that life be like and it's not a life i think any of us would want if any of these appliances were sentient i think that's a very dark thing and it just really wants you to understand that and i think that's odd interesting thing and it's a smart way to interpret these characters and these things and I really enjoyed this film, and I enjoyed what it was trying to do. And I and it's rare you actually see a film that gets better as it goes on, and the songs get better, and everything get, gets better. I really loved seeing this film again. I don't know if I am as attached to it, but I find it a really interesting, odd, strange rewatch and 
kind of exception from the time, even from Hyperion Animation, who would later do Babies, Kids, and Rover Dangerfield. And this, this is like their three films. It's such a unique little strange film, but it kind of reminds me of the 80s where you'd have uniquely weird, different, one-off kind of animated films. But this was the one-off that kind of peeked into the future peeked into what we could do with character animation. It almost kind of envisioned it in a darker, stranger way than like anyone could do now and anyone could have done before. It's a perfect encapsulation of its time period, but it's also a perfect encapsulation of what animation can do with character and what you can say about certain things with that character and with that kind of animation. And I think Brave Little Toaster does that really well. It almost becomes one of the more interesting animation classics of the 1980s. So if you've seen The Brave Little Toaster and you would like to talk about it, then comment below in the comments and subscribe if you would like to. And this was the winner of my Patreon movie review vote. If you would like for me to review a movie of your choice, then click on the link below and pledge, and maybe I'll be reviewing your movie next month. Thank you very much for watching.